So I'm wondering how many of you can finish this line for me. Candy-coated popcorn, peanuts, and a prize. <laughs> peanuts and a prize. That's what you get in Cracker Jacks. Yeah. So when Colton asked me if I would be willing to, to preach one of these lessons in this series on heroes of the faith, I was absolutely delighted. And then when he said he'd like for me to preach the one on Abraham, I felt like I had just reached into a box of Cracker Jacks looking for a piece of popcorn, and I came out with a prize. Because uh, even though it may just be three verses in Hebrews, um, Abraham is the prototype. He's the first person any Jewish person, a Hebrew, would think about in any discussion of faith. The problem is, we could and probably should spend an entire series on the faith of Abraham. And all I have is one sermon. So in this time that we have together, we're going to start in the book of Hebrews. And then we'll go to Genesis, of course. And then we're going to go to Romans and then to Galatians. And then we'll spend a little time in the 16th century. And then we're going to finally end up with some thoughts about what it all means for you and me right here in Temple, Texas in 2022. So if you need to be at work at 8 o'clock in the morning, you might want to go ahead and text your boss because we're going to be here a little while. You might be a little late. We have a lot to cover. So let's go to the text. Hebrews 11, verses 8 through 10. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. The question we're going to address this morning is why the author of Hebrews can point to Abraham and say, Here's an example of the kind of faith we should all enjoy. Of course, these three verses in Hebrews are just the cliff notes. And by the way, I learned in home group last week that it's no longer called cliff notes, they're spark notes. Um, in Hebrews, we, we really only get a peek uh, into Abraham's life. So to get a more complete picture of Abraham, we'll need to go to the source, and that would be Genesis. So please turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 11. Now, I know you're all familiar with this story, but if I were to ask you to tell me the story of how God called Abraham, I suspect many of you would remember it something like this. God found Abraham living in the land of Ur. And because Abraham was a man of uncommon faith, God chose him and told him to pick up his family and move to Canaan a land which God promised to give him, the promised land. And there God would bless Abraham and make a mighty nation of his descendants. And because Abraham had such incredible faith, he obeyed God and left his home in Ur and headed to Canaan. Now, if that's what you remember, you might be surprised to learn that that's not really what happened at all. So what did happen? Let's look at Genesis chapter 11. We'll pick up in verse 31. Now, the text immediately prior to verse 31 is all about Abram's family tree. There we learn that Terah, Abram's father, had three sons, Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran was the father of Lot, but Haran died. We also learn that Abram uh, had married Sarai and that Sarai was barren. So those are the four main characters in this little drama. We have Terah, his son Abram, his wife Sarai, and Lot, Terah's grandson. Okay? Terah, verse 31, Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, and his, his son Abram's wife. And they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. 
So the first rather surprising thing that Genesis tells us is that it wasn't Abraham that decided to leave Ur. It was Terah, his father. And it doesn't say why Terah decided to leave Ur and take his family to Canaan. It doesn't say or even suggest that God told him to go. We don't know why he was headed to Canaan. And we don't know why he bogged down in Haran, which was only halfway there. But he did stop there and he died there. And apparently they were there long enough for Abram to acquire some possessions. But the Bible says nothing about God telling them to leave Ur. And it says nothing about Terah's faith or Abram's faith. In fact, we learn from the book of Joshua that Terah and Abram didn't even know God. They were pagans who worshipped idols. Did you know that? Joshua 24, 2. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates. Terah, the father of Abraham and of Nahor, and they served other gods. So as far as we know, which is all the Bible tells us about this history, Abram didn't know God at all. But then something remarkable happened to Abram after his father died in Haran. Uh, in Haran. We pick up reading in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So this is the covenant that God made with Abraham. It's the first time we see Abram interacting with God, and it, and it wasn't a negotiation. God simply said, here's what I'm going to do. And to boil it down in this covenant, which God repeats multiple times in Genesis, God promises Abram three things. He promises him descendants and land and Messiah, that all the world would be blessed through him. So that's pretty much all we know about Abram at this point in the story. We don't know any more details because that's all the Holy Spirit decided to tell us. But we do have to ask, how did Abram come to know God? There was no Bible for him to read. There was no temple, no land of Israel, no radio broadcast, no internet, no Twitter or Facebook, praise God. He obviously didn't learn about God from his father. He was an idol worshiper. And the culture he came from was entirely pagan. So how did he come to know God? Well, we don't know. But this much we can know for certain. God chose to reveal himself to Abram. We don't know how he did it. Perhaps it was through a burning bush or maybe in a dream. Or maybe God used some other person to tell him about himself. We don't know how he did it, but obviously God made himself known to Abram. We also don't know why God chose Abram and not someone else. The Bible doesn't tell us. But we do know this. It wasn't because of his faith. He was a pagan who worshipped idols when God called him. That's the picture the Bible paints. And I think that even here in the book of Genesis, God through his Holy Spirit is deliberately telling us how he works in our lives. When God chose Abram or when he chooses us, it's an unconditional sovereign act of God. He doesn't choose us because of our faith. And the reason he doesn't is because we're completely unable to believe or to respond to him until he first does his work in our hearts. That's exactly what Jesus told his disciples in John chapter 6. 
in verse 40, uh, 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And he said, this is why I told you, that in verse 65, and this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. You see, none of us will ever come to Christ on our own because we're broken, sinful, fallen people. That's our nature. And we'll never on our own choose Christ because we can't. And it seems to me that God was foreshadowing right here in Genesis what Jesus would later explain to his disciples and to us in John chapter 6. Right here, early in Genesis, with the calling of Abram, God is giving us a picture of a spiritual reality. God revealed himself to Abram and chose him despite his lack of faith. Despite the fact that he was an idol worshiper with no faith at all. In other words, God is the one who did the choosing. He initiated that relationship with Abram. And when we read this text, we also need to ask, how did Abraham come to believe? We know that after his encounter with God in that covenant, Abram's faith was so strong that he set off for a land he had never seen just because God had made a promise with him. How did he acquire that level of faith? For that matter, how does anyone come to faith? Colton talked about this in his first sermon in this series on commendable faith. He reminded us that faith is a gift from God. We see that explicitly in Ephesians chapter 2, and we also see it confirmed right here in the book of Hebrews. At the beginning of chapter 12, immediately after this discourse on the heroes of the faith in chapter 11, the writer of Hebrews tells us that Jesus is the founder of our faith. Let's read that. Chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, those witnesses are the heroes of the faith from chapter 11. Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. A founder is one who starts something. He starts and also perfects our faith. What Scripture is telling us is that our faith is His work in us. Hebrews 11, the chapter we're studying, is all about heroes. And it's good for us to have heroes. They inspire us and they encourage us. And we should hold up Abraham for his obedience and for his faith that inspired that obedience. But let us never lose sight of where that faith comes from in the first place. It's a gift from Almighty God. And we can sing, I have decided to follow Jesus, but we should never forget that where our faith comes from and who deserves the glory for that faith, and that's God. So now that we've identified where Abraham's faith comes from, we're going to talk about what his faith looked like. In his life, we're going to identify three traits, and I'm sure we could list many more, but we're going to talk about three characteristics of Abraham's faith. And the first of these is that Abraham's faith is committed. And here's what I mean by that Abraham took all that he had, all his family and all his possessions, and he left to go where God told him to go. See, he didn't first go on a scouting mission to Canaan just to be sure it was safe when he got there. He didn't rent a storage facility in Haran where he could leave some of his stuff behind just in case. He didn't rent out his home in Haran so that just in case things didn't work out in Canaan, he'd have a place to come back and live. He was all in. Like Cortez, when he landed in the New World, remember him? He burned the ships. And that's what it means to be committed, to be all in. And that's how it should be in our walk of faith. Our life of faith begins when we leave our Haran. We leave our sin and our old life behind and start a new life together with Christ. And there can be no thought of ever going back. 
And by the way, if you read the entire book of Hebrews, that's precisely the message the author of Hebrews is trying to deliver to a church full of tired, struggling, and alienated believers. Don't quit. Stay the course. You can't go back to your former life. So why is it important to be committed to be all in? It's important because we can't leave one foot in Haran and experience the peace and the God-glorifying joy that God desires for us in our new life with Christ. If we're going to glorify Him with our lives, we've got to be all in, committed like Abraham. So what does that look like? What does commitment look like in the life of a believer? Well, here's what it looks like. You spend time with the Lord every day. You make every decision bathed in prayer and for the glory of God. And you enmesh your life with the people of God. You're here, even when you're tired or stressed or you just have too much to do. Abraham's faith was a committed faith. The second characteristic of Abraham's faith is that it was alienating. Just think about what he did. He left the world and the culture that was familiar to him, all that he had ever known his entire life, and he went to live in a foreign land because that's where God called him. He lived in tents his entire life. And understand, that wasn't normal even then, even in that culture. There were towns in Haran, or in Canaan, where people lived in homes, homes that had foundations. But not Abraham. He and his family lived in tents as aliens in that land his entire life. In fact, even though God had promised to give him the entire land of Canaan, the only land that Abraham ever owned was a small plot of ground where he buried his wife, Sarah. Do you feel like an alien in this world? You should, because we are. This world is not our home. God has called us to live in faith in the midst of an alien world. In a secular culture that's foreign to us, or at least it should be foreign to us. So even though our modern American culture appears to be moving in the opposite direction, moving away from the kingdom of God, God has called us to live here to serve him here, even if we must live as aliens until he calls us home. The third characteristic of Abraham's faith is that it was patient. If you'll recall, God had promised Abraham three things, descendants, land, and Messiah. Was Abraham's faith patient? What about descendants? Abraham had been promised so many descendants that they would be like stars in the sky. But he had only one child with his wife, Sarah, and he had to wait till he was 100 years old to see that promise realized. What about land? We've already talked about that. He had been promised the entire country, but in this life, he never saw that come to pass. And what about Messiah? Abraham never saw Jesus. He never knew anything about how God would bless the world through him. And even his descendants would have to wait another 1,500 years to find out. But did God keep those promises? Yeah, he certainly did. Even though Abraham never saw them with his own eyes. So how did Abraham continue to believe? How did Abraham's faith remain so patient over all of those years? Well, Hebrews tells us that too. Let's go back to our text in Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents as an alien with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. 
for he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. So how did he remain patient? Abram's eyes were on the city built by God. That's a city with foundations. In other words, he knows that someday he won't be living in a tent, no longer as an alien, but as a citizen. It's the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. What we learn from Abraham is that a patient faith is focused on heaven. Here on this earth, we see at best through a glass darkly. But a patient faith is focused on the promises of God, and it knows that he will keep them. Now, if you're taking notes, we've identified three characteristics of Abraham's faith. It was committed, it was alienating, and it was patient. Committed, alienating, and patient. C-A-P, CAP, if you like acronyms to help you remember. As a side note, the original version of this sermon had a fourth characteristic of Abraham's faith. His faith was rational, And that one, rational, which starts with R, logically came right after the C for committed. (laughs) I deleted that point, partly because this sermon is already too long and partly because I didn't want the elders to get angry letters about offensive acronyms. (laughs) So now for the rest of the story. As God had promised... Abraham did become the father of a great nation, and his descendants were like the stars in the sky. And those descendants revered him. For the next 1,500 years, the Jewish people held up Abraham not just as the first person in their family tree, but as a hero. They saw him as a hero of the faith, an example to follow. But they didn't quite understand the significance of his faith. The Jewish rabbis believed and taught that God approved of Abraham and blessed Abraham because of his obedience. In other words, God's approval is based on something we do, and that's what they taught. And no one was better taught in that tradition than Saul of Tarsus. But the Jewish rabbis got it wrong, and Saul, who would become Paul, decided to set the record straight when he wrote a letter to the Christians in Rome. In that letter, and go ahead and turn to Romans chapter 4, in that letter, Paul is laboring to help us understand the justification of God. He wants to clarify how God can declare a sinner justified. And remember, when God, in, in this context, we should see him like a judge. When God declares us justified, he's saying, I don't see your sin, I see you as perfectly righteous. From our perspective, being justified means it's just as if I'd never sinned. I find that helpful. Justified means it's just as if I'd never sinned. The prophet Isaiah said it like this, and this is a spectacular picture of justification. In Isaiah 1.18, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, They shall become like wool. So how can a just God do that? How can a holy and just God declare a sinner to be righteous? And this is where Paul sets the rabbis straight. He goes back to Genesis 15 to remind them precisely why God approved of Abraham. And we'll get to Romans in a minute, I promise. Genesis 15, 5, and here God is repeating that covenant he made in chapter 12, and he brought him outside and said, look toward heaven and number the stars, if you're able to number them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. In other words, God saw Abraham as righteous, not because of his obedience, his works like the rabbis taught, but because of his faith, because he believed. That's what Genesis says. So in Romans chapter 4, Paul points back to Abraham as he explains how God justifies sinners. Here in verse 19, where we're going to pick up, Paul is talking about Abraham and God's promise to give him countless descendants. Verse 19, 
He, Abraham, did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Verse 22, that is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness, but the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. You got that? He's talking to you and me. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. So in chapter 5, verse 1, this is where he sums it all up. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. That's the heart of Paul's letter to the Romans. And he uses Abraham's faith to make this point. We're saved, justified, by grace alone, through faith alone, just like Abraham was. And the incredible thing is that we're justified by the very faith that God gave us in the first place. And that is the definition of grace. So is this doctrine, the doctrine of justification by faith alone, is this important? And by the way, the word doctrine is not a dirty word. It's a statement of what we believe to be true. And the question here is, does this doctrine matter? Does this doctrine, justification by faith alone, does it really matter? Well, here's a story from the early church that tells us just how important it was to Paul. We read about it in the second chapter of Paul's letter to the Galatians. And the background is this. Paul and Peter had been working together with a church in Antioch. And the church there, the first church comprised of Jews and Gentiles, had been doing well, worshiping and fellowshipping together. And that was a new thing. It's hard for us today to even grasp how radical that was. Because before this, Jews never mingled with Gentiles in church or anywhere else. It just didn't happen. But in Christ, those things don't matter because we're justified by faith, not circumcision or anything else. So everything in Antioch was going along just fine until some men from Jerusalem arrived who were preaching a different gospel, a gospel of faith plus works in this case, circumcision. And Peter, who didn't want to get sideways with the circumcision group, decided to separate himself from the Gentiles and began to eat only with the Jews. Now, this is Peter, the guy that everyone knew as the leader of the apostles. And his influence over this young church would be impossible to overstate. But what Paul realized, is that Peter, by his actions, had just cast a shadow over the doctrine of justification by faith alone. By his actions, Peter was suggesting that it was faith plus something else. And for Paul, this doctrine of justification by faith alone was the core of the gospel. And he wasn't about to let the gospel of grace be tarnished or diluted, not even by Peter, the most respected and most influential apostle of them all. And so Paul got in his face, and he opened both barrels. He tells us that story in Galatians chapter 2, picking up in verse 11. But when Cephas, Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles, but when they came... He drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, in other words, not in step with the doctrine of justification by faith alone, 
I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? Paul was so convinced that the doctrine of justification by faith alone is the essence of the gospel, that he was willing to do battle to publicly rebuke the leader of the Lord's apostles. And praise God, Peter apparently listened and repented. So the New Testament makes it crystal clear that our justification is based on faith alone. But we humans are sinful, prideful creatures. Even though Scripture makes it clear how God justifies uh, sinners over the course of time, a doctrine of works righteousness crept into the church. In fact, faith plus works eventually became the official doctrine of the church in Rome. Despite what Scripture clearly tells us, despite Paul's efforts to spell it out and warn us of the dangers, it happened. Why did it happen? Why did church doctrine morph over time to suggest that we humans must do something to merit our salvation? You could point to ignorance, and there was much of that, You could point to a lust for power, and there was much of that too. But fundamentally, then and now, it boils down to human pride. It's that simple. You might think that we would love the idea of free grace, but we don't. Our sinful nature bristles at the notion of free grace. It bristles deep down because we want to earn our salvation. We want a portion of the glory that belongs only to God. That's our human condition, our nature, our natural bent. We want to do it on our own so that we can claim some of the credit. We would never say that out loud, of course. But that desire festers here, deep down in our heart. So what happened? 1,500 years after Paul wrote those letters to the Romans and to the Galatians, the church had spiraled into a man-glorifying tradition of works righteousness. The church in Rome was a cesspool of iniquity and corruption, and its doctrine was as corrupt as its leaders. And that's when God raised up a man, Martin Luther, and other courageous men and women like him to reform the church and bring it back to the gospel of grace, to the truth that our justification is based on faith and faith alone. But the church in Rome didn't just roll over and say, well, that's fine. You can believe whatever you want. That idea that men and women would point to what the Bible says about justification and claim that as truth in defiance of what the Pope and his minions taught, well, that led to war. And for more than a hundred years, war raged across Europe with Christians killing Christians. When they had finally had enough, the grandchildren of those who had started the war in the first place got together and signed a peace treaty. It was called the Peace of Westphalia in 1648. At that point, 30% of all the men of fighting age in Europe lay dead. Half a million men lay dead on the battlefield because of this dispute over the grounds of our justification and the authority of the church. Does it matter? Does justification by faith alone matter? Well, it did to them. Does it matter to us? So think about this for just a minute. Why did God decide that faith alone would be his grounds for our justification? He's the sovereign God of the universe. He could have set the rules however he would have liked, as long as those rules don't violate his own character. He could have said we would be justified, sinless in his sight because of our obedience or our sincerity 
That's a common misconception of our day. Doesn't matter what you believe, uh, believe as long as you're sincere. Or by the giving of our money or our time. He could have found a way to justify us with no faith at all, but he didn't. He didn't because our faith glorifies him. Our faith brings glory to God, and if we add anything else to it, it glorifies us. If we add anything to the grounds of our justification, whether that be circumcision or climbing into a baptistry, or regular church attendance, or tithing, or having regular quiet times, or claiming that justification is based on a good decision we've made, then we've stolen some of the glory that belongs only to God, and we've applied it to ourselves. Do we have trouble with grace, with a salvation rooted in faith alone? We all do. We might know better in our minds, but our corrupt hearts want to diminish the grace that God freely gives us. Why? Because we want to share in his glory. And that's our sin nature clinging to us. But God didn't create this world because he wanted you or me to be glorified. He didn't create it because he loved you and me so much that he wanted to give us a place to live. He didn't create us because he was lonely or because he needed anything from us. He created all things so that he would be glorified. And if we're going to live solely Deo Gloria, for God's glory alone, we've got to wrap our minds and our hearts around the truth that he has justified us by grace alone through faith alone. And never let anything, anything, dilute the purity of God's grace. We are the spiritual children of Abraham. Isaiah described Abraham's faith as the rock from which we're hewn. Where did Abraham get that kind of faith? God gave it to him. Just as God gives us whatever faith we possess. And why does the author of Hebrews want us to look to Abraham? We look to Abraham because his faith is committed, and that kind of commitment empowers us to leave our land of Haran, leaving nothing behind, beginning a new life in a new land where Jesus Christ rules, and we are his faithful servants. It's a faith that says, I'm all in. We look to Abraham because his faith is alienating. We know we're not of this world or this culture, but this is where God has planted us, and this is where we will take our stand and hold the line. And we look to Abraham because his faith is patient. It's a faith that holds fast, even when that for which we hope is not yet seen with our own eyes. It's persistent, stubborn, and resolute. But most important... It's a faith that matters eternally. Because faith and faith alone is what justifies us before the God who created us. It's why God can look at you and me despite all our sin and failure and see only the righteousness of Christ. Praise God that though our sins are as scarlet, He sees us as white as snow.